Hello, and welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Monday, August 1st, 2022, and we kick off this new month with more questions than answers, including are we in a recession? Will the Fed pivot? Have stocks bottomed? Lucky for us, we have Real Vision's in-house expert, Roger Hurst, here to help us make sense of what is going on. Hi, Roger. Hi, Maggie. How's it going? It's going okay. It, it seems a, a sort of funny time, isn't it? Um, and one of the things that strikes me, and, and so happy to have you here today, because there seems to be all these questions and very little consensus as to what the answers are. I mean, you hear all sorts of people, all, all sorts of sort of experts saying almost contradictory things one after the other. Why is it that the outlook seems so unclear right now? Well, I think you sort of nailed uh, quite a lot of it there, which is that the, we're in this sort of period where um, it feels like we could be going through, through a transition. So, you know, what we've seen basically is, is that there's been this battle between, you know, Fed calls it price on the one hand and growth on the other. The market really kind of thinks of it as inflation and recession. And at the end of last year, the Fed clearly said, we're not going for growth anymore. We're here to cap price. And I'm saying price, not inflation, because inflation, it often gets us all confused. We all think of inflation as higher price, but let's just call it higher price. And they said, we're going to cap that. And the market front ran that earlier on in the year. And because the market front ran that, or front front ran that, mm -hmm. and you had this big move in, in yield, big move in interest rate expectations, then things started to get, started to unwind. Or it looked like they were starting to unwind. We started to see risk assets going down. So now the market started going, oh, growth, recession, you know, that's the thing we've got to worry about, not price. But this is where the battleground comes in because the Fed is still very much saying, no, it's price. I mean, at this moment in time, you've got the highest level of CPI we've had in 40 years at 9.1%, and it's made a new peak. It has not rolled over yet. And what the market's doing quite rightly is it's looking forward. But what the Fed does, in some ways quite rightly, is they always look backwards. And the market's now saying, we want the Fed to start looking forwards, which they don't normally do. So the Fed is still saying price, and cash carriers are basically saying that over the weekend, whereas the market now is sensing there is a slowdown coming or the slowdown is very much here. And that kind of makes sense because when you get the sort of levels of CPI that we've seen going back to the 1970s, at this level and quite a lot lower, actually, you've always been either just before or more normally within a recession itself. And that recession, you see that peak in CPI. So everybody kind of can be right and wrong at the same time. And remember, the Fed only meets every normally 30 to 45 days. In fact, it's now going to be two months until they meet next. So there's an awful long time for the market to try and work out what's going on. It's actually a good thing because that gives more time for the Fed to actually see some data coming through. Yeah. And and they and they kind of said that this and this sparked a huge rally last week. They, they kind of ditched their forward guidance and said, listen, we're data dependent. And as you point out, we've got some time. And so I think that maybe help spur some thought that maybe they would change their mind. They, they We had an ISM reading out. The Institute of Supply Management sounds really boring, but it is something that I know you all folks on. Raul talks about it all the time. I mean, all of his charts kind of are layered over this ISM. Why is this particular piece of data so important? It's used as a very much as a benchmark in the same way that the yield curve can be used as a benchmark. And people always say the ISM needs to go below 50, which is the headline number. And in fact, it needs to get to 45. When it gets to 45, you have a recession. But when it gets to those levels, the Fed always backpedals. And there's some truth in that. In fact, there's a lot of truth in that. Um, but at the same time, the, the subcomponents is what people are really excited about here or worried about in some ways, which is things like um, new orders and inventories. And new orders um, has been this sort of ratio of new order to inventories has suggests that the ISM is going to go a lot lower. And then today we have prices paid coming out, which is that inflationary element which came down from, I think it was 74-ish down to 60. And everyone went, look, yes, this, this price issue is now kind of getting, you know, getting capped and is now rolling over. But I would say that at 60, that is still slightly above the, the average going back to 1980. So it's rolled over, which it does regularly, but it's not yet saying this is outright, you know, a lowering of prices, but we can see that elsewhere. So it's a big, important data point, but one thing I would also say here is ISM is big companies. These are the big, often exporting companies. This is actually, in my view, a lagging indicator because this has been more about consumers and small businesses. That's where the slowdown started this time around. ISM is lagging. We saw this back in the 1970s. We had ISM above 50. It was at 54 ones and at 62 ones when we went into a recession in the US. So ISM may not be the best indicator this time around. I think we've been getting the best indicators already from the small business survey and from consumers and consumer sentiment. 
That is so interesting. And, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say for our viewers who are listening, when we had George on um, Gangalas last week, he I asked him what he thought was going to break if the Fed overdid it. And his answer surprised me. And it was small businesses. But now that's got me really concerned when you're pointing this out, because they are the engine of economic growth for so much of the economy. So that is something that's worrying. You just said something really important, though. So you there seems to be a divide between what's forward looking indicators and it's this stuff that that you all seem to be a pay attention to, um, you know, the people in the hedge fund world, the the sort of professionals. And then there's lagging, which seem to be the things that are all over the newspaper headlines that the rest of us are seeing. Should we be looking at different things? Should we be paying more attention to what's happening on the small business front? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's this is all a bit about um, small businesses and consumers and mm. um, very much the four. So, I mean, things like lagging indicators. I mean, inflation is lagging. I mean, inflation is something which, you know, you see these spikes, spikes in inflation into recessions. And what you want is a good old fashioned recession to cap higher prices. Let's call it higher prices, not inflation, to cap those high prices and then bring them down. In every one of those recessions when we had CPI, so prices up in high single digits, double digits, after the recession, these things came down often six, seven um, whole points. So that's what you want. And, and other people talk about other people. Oh, one second. I love it. We got so excited talking about the business cycle and economics that I think Roger literally knocked his microphone over. <laughs> there you go. I, I, I was so excited with my arms flying out. Of that's exactly what I said. So I, I like that we could get so excited about these topics that, that you literally knock your mic over. Drop. It's not a drop the mic. It's a knock the mic moment, but we'll take it. That's right. Can you still hear me? Yes, actually, you sound better than before. Great. Excellent. Right. It looks like my mic's not working. I'm now using the computer. Anyway, so getting back to my excitement of this, which is that the other one is the employment number. And the employment number is always at its lowest, at its tightest, at its best, as you go into recession or just before. And in those inflationary periods of the 1970s, in fact, you almost got this absolute low at the moment you hit recession. So when people say we've got a robust um, employment numbers, when people say we've got you know, these, these other data points, that, you know, like CPI, those are things that have happened in the past and will continue to be backward looking. So for instance, the most important thing for the Fed, and this is where that difficulty comes in understanding where we are, is that it's not enough for the Fed, it's not sufficient for the Fed to see a peak in prices. They need to see a robust pullback in prices because, you know, inflation is actually the change month on month, year on year. But if gasoline prices, so petrol prices here, gasoline prices there, stay five, six dollars, uh, uh, you know, in terms of um, per gallon, and we haven't seen wages pick up yet, people are still worse off. So it's still bad. And this is the problem that we've had in this environment is that what we've seen is that these prices have been killing growth. And this is this big battle. Prices, those high prices cause the market to price in something which eventually caused things to roll over. Those high prices, we're seeing real wages falling. We're seeing real retail sales falling. So you need to cap and kill prices in order to have sustainable growth. But what the market now wants is for them to support growth again before they'd necessarily cap price. Mm. And that's where the risk comes in because if they go too early, and if you have risk assets that are rallying, equities rallying, you're in danger of supporting prices again, pushing those prices back up. So there's a very, very big balancing game. And, and if you see the reaction of the market, 75 basis points from the Fed, they do that, and then the market rallies, that increases their ability to do another 75 basis points later on, unless we see an absolute collapse in inflation. So this is the risky thing for equities. Let's 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 if, let's stop right there, Roger, and explain that to us, because I think this is a really, really important point that I'm not hearing people talk about. So if we rally and, and we rallied because they got rid of the guidance, they said they're data dependent, which made everybody think they're about to pivot. But you're saying if you can get a rally and and you don't have things absolutely falling apart at the seams in a way that's systemic, they say, oh, they can with it. They can withstand it. We can do more. You actually think that's a sign that they can go further. The opposite of what the market's thinking. Yeah. So it's almost like how much do you want the, the market to rally? And this is where we've got these two points that come with it, which is if they, they basically loosen, you know, pivot, which, by the way, if they decide to do 50 from 75, that's not a pivot. That's just not going as aggressively as before. But let's say they did officially pivot and everyone thought they were and, and risk prices started to rise. That's a loosening of financial conditions that increases the chances 
of, of prices remaining stickier at a higher level, which means the Fed then has to surprise the market by being even more hawkish, which means that your rally in equities is limited. On the flip side, which is where the market is currently going, but it's slightly erroneous in terms of, I think, necessarily the rally, is that if prices are collapsing as quickly as people think, and some people are actually thinking we could get um, a month-on-month -month change into mid to low single digits, so 0.4, 0.3, if we got that, that would suggest that we've had such a dramatic slowdown in growth that you need to start having, you know, pricing negatively on equities because earnings are coming down, employment's going a hell of a long way up, and that's your new leg lower in equities, whereas before we we're pricing equities lower because of the policy response to high prices. So I still think that the bounce here is something we have to be very, not skeptical of, but we have to be careful of because it also, you know, it happened, there's two other things in this. It happened into month end. Month end is always something which can blindside us. But it also really kicked off on the 14th of July. And the 14th of July was the day when the dollar just went through parity with the euro, touched 99.60, 0.9960, and then rallied. That was like a technical level. And it was the dollar's reversal that really sparked this new rally that started on the 14th of July, which gave an imp impetus by the interpretation of the Fed. But I think that, therefore, this is still, you know, feels to me like there are these other factors and it's a relief from sort of oversold and overly negative um, sentiment that's driving this rather than a true reversal expectation on the Fed. I think we're backfilling that story. Mm. Why would the dollar have that sort of reaction in equities? Or why would equities rather react to the dollar in that way? Why would the dollar be the catalyst? Well, there's actually risk assets as a whole. So what had happened is we'd gone from worrying about, you know, this is where we started to really worry about growth away from price, is that we worried about price. And that first move lower on the equity market, if we ignore what happened in Ukraine, what's happening in Ukraine, the first move lower was because we repriced and the market repriced yields. It wasn't the Fed that took the 10-year to 3.5 or the Fed that took the two-year to 3.5 from 16 basis points. The Fed is at 2.5 projecting to go to maybe 3.4. It's the market that did this because everyone loves to knock the Fed. So we've seen these sorts of moves already, but about four or five weeks ago, what we started seeing is that the next leg lower or the next difficulty we're seeing in global risk assets was the dollar kept on going higher and higher and higher. So we've gone from this being about tightness of financial conditions caused by higher interest rates and higher yields to tightness of financial conditions caused by a stronger dollar. So the dollar was leading at this point risk assets. We started to try and form a bit of a base a few days before in equities, but ultimately was the dollar. So when the dollar then reversed, that was the relief. That was another loosening of financial conditions. And that was what really started to drive the equity market higher from the 14th of July and then given that impetus. So, and the dollar is key because it's, it's if you have a surging, disorderly surge in the dollar, that's very much tightening financial conditions. And you could see this in emerging markets really starting to struggle as well. It wasn't just developed markets in the US. It was now everywhere with almost every currency versus the dollar on the back foot. You know, it, it's so interesting because you're right. There is a there is a narrative and it is all connected to the Fed. But I think it's important to to flag that there are other assets and this idea that these asset markets are in relation to each other, I think is so important. And it occurs to me as I'm sitting here, we're having this conversation. This is very similar to what we're doing in the academy, um, which is we, we talked before we came on air that you did. I think you did one of one of the first daily briefings. But for some watching, they're going to you're going to be more familiar to them because they've seen you if they've started the investing course, they've seen you um, and Jamie um, and James sort of breaking this down. And I hear a lot that this is a really macro moment that you have to understand things like currencies, things like the business cycle to be able to to figure out what's going on. Um, Talk, talk to me a little bit about that. It's really why we're doing the Academy, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this has been sort of, you know, the, something we've all been very excited to do. And, and Raoul's been sort of wanting to do this for a long time. And George, who's been the, the, the man behind it, has been developing this for 18 months. But the Academy is basically, we're trying to put together loads of building blocks to help everybody create their own framework. Because, you know, people always want a trade idea. But trade ideas are relevant to maybe one in 10 people because of your different time horizons, because of the different areas, regions, and assets that you can invest in. So what we wanted to do is create an academy, which is which is basically a whole bunch of modules. And there's basically the first one is the, the real investing course, which is about 10 hours long, where we try to build this framework of understanding of who are you as an investor? What are your goals? What should you look at? And what are the main building blocks of the market? 
We've also got modules in there from people like Dave Floyd, who's got a technical trading one, Peter Brandt on trading strategy, and we're going to add DeMarc. And then hopefully over the next few weeks, I'm going to be chatting with Imran Lacker and doing an options course. The point of all of this is that we wanted just to help people build this framework and have this sort of reference point and build a library of materials so that people can feel empowered to make the decisions themselves, to trade for themselves and, and feel comfortable that, you know, all the problems that everybody's face are out there. And what we've also done with this, in particular, the, the real investing course, we've gone into our library of, of information and videos and films, and we've taken the best stuff from the best guys who we've had on our platform, who are basically telling, you know, telling their own stories about how all these things happened. And we've tried to then articulate that into these modules. Yeah, break it down. And I think that's what's important. And, you know, I, for, for a lot of us, I think that, it, you know, when you had a huge bull market, you could just park your money in a fund and it went up. And that, but we see from the questions coming through and the way I started this today, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of mixed signals and, you know, terminology maybe that people haven't understood. And I, I think it, it's going to be really hard to do well unless you have some of that background right now. That's my concern that people have been in passive investing are going to struggle as if we are in this macro moment. I mean, there, it's, this is the thing is that there is no right or wrong answer. There is nobody out there who um, will not be able to get a grip um, of the marketplace because sometimes it's actually relatively simple. And the key thing here is that there are so many unknowns. You talked about the contradictions earlier. I mean, there are some fantastically bullish technicals out there at the moment. There's some indicators where when you've had a sell off that was that aggressive in July that then bounces back out by that magnitude. You've only ever seen them in some of the major lows of the market of the last 40, 50 years. Sentiment we know has been absolutely atrocious. Positioning from hedge funds has been very, very short. But at the same time, there's so many things that we haven't seen in this marketplace that you would normally expect to see in a major market low in terms of volume, in terms of the way volatility reacts. And we also know that some of the biggest players in this market are not people who do surveys, who have sentiment. It's actually computer and rules-based funds who, like Active, basically overtook in terms of volume within the market and, and actually importance within the market. So are they the drivers? Well, they're not the ones who are negative here because they don't do surveys. But we don't know the answers. No one does. Yeah. But what we're looking for is all those things, you know, all these little pieces, like the dollar, like those yields, which are having their influence on the market. Sentiment is important too. But things like we might get our indications from things like Korea, where the Korean equity market has not bounced particularly well over the last two weeks. And yet that is a big, well, when I say big, it's an open exporting economy. I'd like to see the Kospi market doing a lot, lot better to be feeling that there is a real rebound here, but they're still being significantly impacted by slowing global growth. Yeah, which, which again, maybe one of those indicators that's not on on our radar. I mean, one of the things I think is going to be helpful, and, and I think we've talked about this, is having a framework. And then if you have a framework, and I think this is what you're all going for, then you can plug in this information that's coming through all these interviews and things like you just said, and plug it into your, something that's specific to you, and then make some sense of it from there. And I think this question about the bear market rally is, an, is a fantastic example of that. So many people write into us saying, have stocks bottom. What's your forecast for the end of the year level on the S&P 500? Should I buy? Should I get back in? Should I take profits? And, and you know, we've had people say, listen, if you're a trader, this is an interesting time for you. If you're not, maybe you don't want to it's dicey. You don't want to mess around. But what does that mean? You have to know which one you are, right? So talk to us a little bit about what, what does it mean if you're in a, why is everyone asking, are we in a bear market rally? Why is that important? Well, it's, it's, it's important because obviously a bear market rally should never take out the high. And in fact, a bear market rally should be your first leg. You could say that the first leg down was a leg into the low of July. Some people may say it was a three legs or it's five legs, but let's just pretend if it's a bear market rally, we've had one leg down, then you have a classic bear market rally, which is normally anything up to 62% of the down move. We're currently between a 38 and a 50. And these numbers are Fibonacci numbers. We use them as a, as a, a guide. So you want a basic bear market rally should be 38% just over. 50 is very normal. 62 is quite normal. Above 62% and you start to think maybe we can take out the highs. So until we get to those levels, and it's I think we've got to get above something like 42, 27, I think might be 50%. You need to break these levels through. So what you can do is you can have these as signposts. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's going to go there or beyond, but I can say, oh, first target now hit. 
okay, I'm going to change my stop if I'm long playing the bear market rally. And I can keep going and keep going. So it's ways of just changing your, um, your trading mentality. And, and as I pointed out earlier, it's all about frameworks. A framework applies to a day trader or a long-term investor, whereas a trade idea might only apply to one or the other. But all these things might inform, okay, if you're a trader, you want to take profits on that rally. Mm. If you are a longer-term investor, above 62%, you might start going, I'm going to start building my longs for the long term again. Whereas a day trader might still be, no, I'm still looking for the next leg down to go, to go into. So these are the things, the framework matters to the individual. And part of that, um, the, the academy we have and the investing course is we help you identify whether you are a trader, whether you're an investor, whether you take lots of risk, little risk, lots of positions or few positions. These are all important to each individual. And then you apply a market framework onto your own investing framework and try and work those two together to come up with what should be something you're comfortable with. Yeah. And it's going to be incredibly important right now. And um, we have some questions coming in uh, to this point of, of and, and they're great. I want to try to work through a couple of them. Um, Ralph asking, can you discuss euro dollar futures a bit as the as the dollar, the U.S. dollar strengthens? Should euro dollar sink? No. So the euro dollar future is, is a funding future um, and it's normally a three month future. And it's effectively the banking, it's the lending, in simple terms, it's the, the um, banks lending to each other funding for dollars or dollar funding. And it's normally the external, so ex-US market. So what people are looking at there is it's a decent proxy under normal circumstances for uh, expectations of where the Fed is going. So if you look at Fed funds, which is a future on where we think the Fed funds or target rate goes, versus the euro dollar, they normally move together. The way the euro dollar works is it's 100 minus the futures level. If the futures level is at 97, it implies 3% funding. So 100 minus 97. What it should do is if we are seeing a growth slowdown, the euro dollar, should, euro dollar future should rally, which means that funding levels are getting tighter. So it might rally from 97 to 98 to 99, which is 3 to 2 to 1% funding rate. That's what we should expect. The dollar, the actual dollar itself, should still operate independently of that. But if we have a screamingly higher dollar, tightening financial conditions, I would expect the euro dollar future to rally because that would indicate growth is slowing dramatically. But they're, they're not, that's in times of probably excess and extreme. Otherwise, these things can move relatively independently on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have another question coming from uh john a 210 spread why is it widening so 210 presumably that's the yield curve um yes. and the yield curve at the moment is actually so i'm, I'm not 100 percent sure because that's the 210s yield curve so the spread between the 10-year yield versus the two-year yield that's just going more and more negative more and more inverted because the way we always look at it we use the 10-year minus the two-year if you expect things to be slow in the future you expect the yield curve to invert because the way to think of this is the 10-year is really a indicator of optimism growth sentiment the two-year is really an indicator of where fed funds are going if you think growth is going to slow that 10-year yield will drop below the two-year yield and this is what might happen if we don't get a handle on inflation is the fed might have to go more aggressively at the front and that means they'll be killing growth at the back and this is what we saw in the 1970s where we went to minus 200 basis points. At the moment, we're at minus 30, which means that the 10-year yield is 30 basis points below the two-year yield. Normally, 10-year yield should always be higher than the two-year, but not at the moment. So right now, that spread is becoming more and more inverted. And as I say, in the 70s, this is what happened right into the recession. In the period since 1985 to 2020, the curve inverted, then it re-steepened, then you hit a recession. That's not what's happening this time around. So I think that we have to look at the 70s, but at the moment it's getting steeper, sorry, deeper into negative territory because the 10-year yield is dropping more than the two-year yield. We have some I hope questions. that was relatively clear. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, listen, these are these, these are complex questions. And again, this is why we're really leaning hard into the uh, you know, into the education part of it because um, it's getting, it's it's tricky. It's a really tricky time. I want to touch on currencies and we're not only lucky enough to have you today, Roger, let's bring in Weston Nakamura, who's been all over the yen move for us um, and tweeting about it again today. Um, and 
So this is this has been I think this is a complex area for people to understand, too, but it's super important. And Weston, I know you've been paying a lot of close attention to what's ha been happening with dollar yen. So, you know, talk to us about what you've been seeing and what people need to understand about what's happening in the currency market. Sure. Um, good morning, Roger and Maggie. Um, so basically what you're seeing right now after, you know, the, the moment after FOMC, July FOMC um, came out, you know, moment after, but shortly thereafter, you see this massive rally in uh, the yen. So that's that's dollar yen basically collapsing, um, you know, down about, I think it's around three and a half percent in, call it three trading days. Um, basically, it's the, the biggest two-day rally into the end of the week, biggest two-day rally for the yen since March of 2020. Um, and so the, uh, it's pretty insane given the fact that this is a currency that uh, is the, was the worst performing currency. I think it still is the worst performing currency year-to-date versus the dollar. Um, it's funny, Roger, you keep mentioning July 14th. July 14th is dollar-yen high, which was just a hair away from printing at that 140 handle. Um, and right now you're just seeing a massive short squeeze. Now, the reason that that matters, you know, like, why should I, why do you, why should you care, you know, about what dollar yen is doing? The reason you should care is because dollar yen or shorting the yen essentially became the, uh, macro trade, if not the fed trade, right? Because like, you know, we guys are talking about Euro dollar futures and all that implied volatility on Euro dollar futures is, is insanely high. So rates traders would normally take a outright bet on what fed funds, you know, where they're going to be. They don't know what to make of the Fed, so they're just playing the policy divergence trade between BOJ, you know, the, this staunch dove versus a hawkish Fed. And when you get perceptions of a potentially not so hawkish Fed um, via the FOMC from uh, from July, you get a, you know, uh, and you have this this largest um, short, the most crowded, you know, position in global macro. When that reverses, it's going to be vicious, right? And so you should care because I don't really care what the asset is. I don't care what the direction is. But if the most crowded glo you know, global macro trade is being reversed and people are rushing for the exits, it's time to pay attention. Yeah. So does it do we have any sense of of how long that can last? Because I always hear people say, and I think you tweeted this, Weston, that uh, bear market rallies can rip your face off or short squeezes can too. I um, mean, there's a feeling like there's something happening both in U.S. stocks going up, the dollar yen trade reversing, but everyone's trying to figure out, can this last or is it temporary? And do you need to get out of the way? Do you have a sense of, of what's happening when it comes to dollar yen? Yeah, it's it's so tricky um, to, to figure this out because there are so many. It, it's it's kind of weird because there's so many different you know types of investors. You guys are talking about you know what kind of investor are you? Um, but. <laughs> There are global macro hedge funds who are short yen, um, and there are retail lever day traders in Japan who are long, record long dollar. Um, they're all on the same side of the trade, or they were up, up until very recently. So, um, and they cross hold assets, you know, but they also, you know, are on other sides of each other's bets too. So, how it kind of spills out is, I, I think it's we're going through it right now. It's just going to be very messy. I don't think that we can tell right away. Like, okay, this is going to correlate to this. This is going to correlate to this necessarily. Like, for example, um, Gabriel, can you pull up a uh, chart two, for example? Because um, you guys are talking about, you know, uh, euro dollar futures. So this basically is just a chart of yen futures. Which, by the way, the yen, yen futures and yen uh, call options on yen futures. Um, open interest. That's what's really been doing these stair step movements upwards for for yen. But so yen futures and euro dollar. This is deck twenty two uh, futures. They moved in lockstep tandem because again yen was the Fed trade, right? Mm. Um, but what you're seeing now is you're seeing this like this divergence. And so what that is is that's the yen no longer trading as a um, a Fed trade anymore or a policy divergence trade. It's now just being, you know, it's at the whim of financial the rules of financial markets, margin calls and all that kind of thing and short squeezes. Um, and so it's just just getting lifted higher and higher and higher and detaching from, uh, you know, your dollars. So. Again, this is like uh, it's going to be a very messy time, and there's going to be a lot of things that used to correlate that um, you really probably can't depend on at this current moment, um, or you should at least question. So uh, it's time to be very cautious, and things that you probably never thought would correlate do correlate.
Yeah, I know that you I know that you were early warning about the possibility of that, Weston. A lot of people are very thankful for that on Twitter. And you're I know you're going to release a video kind of walking us through the whole um, sort of evolution of that and what you're seeing in the markets. Um, Roger, people asking about that. We have a question from a viewer about the euro, your outlook for the euro as well. Yeah, so I think there's two things we can we can look at here on, on both these currencies because these two obviously make up the lion's share of the DXY. The euro is about 57%. The next biggest chunk is the yen. And what really matters here is that there's some structural issues at play. Now, for Europe, it's exogenous. It's There's, a, there's a, an energy crisis, and there's nothing policymakers can do about that. And Europe has to import more and more expense or expensive and increasingly expensive energy equivalents to gas or gas at high prices which is going to put pressure on your currency because you're importing all, all your requirements. That's not going away anytime soon unless you have an enormous almighty recession that causes everything to collapse, which is not good for Europe either because it's an exporting nation. But it goes back to that. It touched parity and it bounced. And the same day that, as, as Weston pointed out, we saw the peak in dollar yen. To me, that suggests that this was firstly a technical move, which then we got the momentum from the Fed. The other thing at play here for, for Japan, obviously, is that Japan is still doing yield curve control, 25 basis points. When you control yields, your outlet has to be your currency, which is why dollar yen was strengthening, yen was weakening. What's happened since the Fed and over the last week and a half is that the growth scare has come in, which means those US yields have been coming down towards Japanese yields, which means there's less pressure on dollar yen because there's less pressure on the Bank of Japan mm -hmm. to have to dilute its currency because those yields have less, a sli slightly less tendency to want to go higher against the Bank of Japan when the US yields were 2.6 than when they were at 3.5. So the yields, global yields compressing slightly towards the Bank of Japan is helping that. But then it kind of goes back to, okay, that, that, um, that recessionary story, I think, or that slowdown story clearly helps. That probably switches dollar yen back to being a safe haven currency, which it used to always be. But then with this capping of, of the Bank of Japan yields, it's meant that it's become this this outlet for, for pressure. Now, where do I think Euro goes? Because I think Euro's problems are structural, I do think that this was not the low in the dollar versus the Euro. I think we go beyond parity because, you know, the Nord Stream's at 20%, was at 40% before maintenance, now at 20%. Price is not coming back anytime soon. There would have to be an almighty slowdown. And that would normally be a positive dollar environment as well. So. On the euro, I still think it goes there. The yen, like, like Wes was saying, it's a little bit harder now because you need for the yen to have clear legs back to a lower level dollar, higher level. You need the Bank of Japan to be in full liquidity, liquidity mode, as it were, which means you need U.S. yields rallying. And I do think that the long end of the U.S. market, those yields will struggle to go a lot higher because if the Fed comes out and is hawkish, that kills growth. And if growth is dying right now, that kills growth because it's dead growth. Like those will yields down. So euro, I think, will go lower from here. I think it's a bear market squeeze having hit parity. Dollar yen, it's a tricky one, as, as, as Weston said. You, you know, um, I was actually talking about this um, with Andreas the other day, but going into the FOMC, um, I was thinking the trade, the trade be the euro against the yen. So I would just leave the dollar out of it, right? Because what you're, I mean, so the euro is getting, both the euro and the yen are getting crushed by the dollar and by basically everything. Except the euro against the yen is actually relatively buoyant. And the risk right now to being long yen at the moment is Japan's current sort of energy import situation um, that could, you know, escalate, uh, continually escalate because Japan is buying a lot of spot LNG, you know, at market. But bad as it is, uh, for for Japan, it's not as bad as Europe is. And, you know, what I was saying in this video, it was that I'd be very hard pressed to envision some sort of scenario in which Japan is in a worse shape um, than Europe for in terms of procuring energy imports. So whatever headwinds Japan has regarding that Europe is and will be, you know, like slightly worse, uh, if not considerably worse, um, than Japan, at least going to the, you know, the end of this year. So, Shorting specifically the euro yen cross rate has almost a built in hedge for that specific energy import risk. So that's why that's the way I'm kind of looking at it too. So you have yen upside, you have euro downside. Yeah, I mean, Europe's a, Europe in some ways is a basket case today and it's beyond, it's beyond our control. It's not quite so bad for the UK. Um, you know, gas prices are slightly lower, but it's, it's out of control for, for Europe and Germany. And if you look at Germany's consumer confidence figures, GFK consumer confidence, Below where we were in COVID, and both COVID and today are significantly worse than they ever got in 2008, because German, you know, the German consumer 
the German economy did sort of okay relatively back then. So these these it's very, very bad for Europe right now. I can't see a positive for the euro here, apart from it got oversold, it had a rebound, but otherwise everything stacked up against it. Yeah. And if I'm, if we circle back, because we're almost out of time, um, that if for, for the U.S., if I, if I understand what we were talking about before, Roger, um, either scenario, it looks like a hard scenario to find a really fantastic case for U.S. equities to sort of resume that tremendous rally they put in in July, because even though it felt horrible, the Nasdaq was up, what, 12 percent, the S&P up, up 9 percent. But you're pointing out that if they rally, the Fed can feel more aggressive. And if the Fed pivots, it means that things are shit and horrible, which which will be bad for corporate earnings. So it doesn't look like a good scenario either way for U.S. stocks. No. And look, if, if people are, are really hell bent on it, um, you know, use optionality. You know, Weston was talking about optionality, but the equity market is not badly priced at the moment. The, the, the actual volatility of the S&P is about 26 on a 50 to 100 day view. But now we're getting the options market is closer to 22. Uh, 19 in the front months, getting out to 22 in September. So it's high, but it's not badly priced. It's, it's close to fair value. This is not expensive volatility, implied volatility. This is fair value volatility. So you can buy those calls and rather than stick all your cash into the equity market, into what might be a bear market rally, you buy those calls, which is a bit like buying a put against a long equity position. But you don't want to do that. Buy these calls. And if things go horribly wrong and it rolls over, you walk away with just your premium lost. But... If we can't have one of these almighty rallies that takes everyone's face off, you're in the game. You won't, you know, you won't get the whole percentage upside, but you'll make, you'll take some of it. So there are ways of doing this. My feeling is that because of the things I've talked about, these clear technical factors rather than real factors. And the one thing I would say about this whole bear market is it's hardly been talked about in the mainstream press. It's almost never been on the news. I've not seen anybody really talk about this outside of financial markets. So this has not been a really public bear market in the ways that we've seen them before. And it's actually been very ordered, very well ordered. And one of the reasons it has is that because of this fair value in optionality, institutions kept buying puts, market sold off. They sold those puts back to the market, the market makers, which capped vol. So this volatility never had one of these almighty spikes. It never felt like we had that great smash bang denouement of a normal bear market. Maybe this is different. It just feels that we've not had all the classic box, boxes ticked apart from one or two incredibly stretched technical indicators. But if you want to play the upside, you know, options, as I said, 22 vol, it might seem high bet, but compared to, let's say, five years ago, but it's not expensive. This is why we have to get that options course online, because a lot of us, I think, maybe who haven't who haven't done that are, are going to need to understand that so we can protect ourselves. Weston, the question for you and I is, how do we get in the pub with these guys next time when they tape the next segment? That's something you and I are going to have to noodle over. <laughs> but Roger and Weston, yeah. Weston, thank you both so much for being with thank us. You. Great day to have you as we kick off a new month. Thank you. Good to, have you. Good to see you as well. Thanks a lot. And we're going to be back, of course, tomorrow. Andreas Deno Larson will be here with Tony Greer. And we're going to give you a little bit more information about the Academy and the Real Investing course. Everything you need to know, you can go to our website or watch this clip. Thanks. Take care and good luck out there. I can see on Twitter and on YouTube and all over the place that everybody's struggling with these financial markets. How the hell do we invest? How do we make sense of this world? It's too complicated. There's too many things. What the hell is a yield curve? What does it mean to me? How does inflation play into my portfolio? These kind of questions are really important and they remain unanswered to this day. And that's why we've done something very different at Real Vision. We've actually decided to solve that problem at scale affordably for everybody. That is the Real Vision Academy and the Real Vision Investing course. We've created this incredible structured course so you can truly learn how to navigate financial markets and become a better manager of your own portfolio, your own wealth and your own destiny. These are so important. The other thing about the courses that you find online, not only do they charge you a fortune, but it's basically done by somebody who's got no experience in financial markets. This is different. This is built by the head of proprietary trading at Goldman Sachs Equities in London, who also worked with me at the GLG Global Macro Hedge Fund, Lex Van Dam. We took his incredible course, which he trained people for the BBC show Million Dollars Traders and turned it into something truly spectacular, taking it to when Lex never dreamed it could go. Now, Real Vision is always a little bit different as well. We don't make learning boring. 
I mean, we filmed some of these videos in extraordinary places like bunkers underground to pubs. We want to make it feel natural, interesting, immersive. So when you come out the other side, you are a better investor. If you join us now, you get an incredible discount. Go to realvision.com forward slash the academy. See you there.